Domo greetings. Uh, my name is Rahula and I'm one of Bante Chandana's students. And just before you get to listen to one of his amazing discourses, um, I just wanted to share with you that Bante is a, a wandering monk. So he has no home and he purely relies on donations um, of dana by followers and by the community to survive just for the bare essentials. So if you feel of value, please feel free to share after the video and enjoy. Thank you. So why do we show respect to monks? Or That's the question, right? So why do we bow? Why do we? It could be the monks, or it could be a statue of a Buddha, a Bodhi tree. Why do we bow? What does that mean? What does it signify? Well, to be asked that question is 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 a good thing. It means the person is thinking. The person is pondering as to why am I doing this. I've addressed, <clears throat> excuse me, this uh, question. I remember a few years ago, um, it was a different context, but nevertheless, it's it's uh, it's there on the on the YouTube. However, I do want to address it here again because it's an important question to be asked, to ask. Often we just go and copy individuals around us, what we are, especially from you know, culture to culture makes a difference. If a person has grown up in a traditionally Asian or a Buddhist country, for example, usually, especially if you are in those countries or in a temple at a temple visiting, you see how individuals would start to express that. Now, I'm not going to say it is just a routine, it is just a very superficial, it is just a rites and ritual part. It doesn't have to be just that. For some, it is actually far deeper than that. It is meaningful. So the location, the geography, doesn't matter as much as we would think. But to ask the question is a good thing. Why am I bowing down to a bhikkhu? Why? Why? This is a question that Lord Buddha addresses on several occasions in the suttas. It's interesting because I'm currently narrating a series of suttas um, as I finish up the Book of the Tens from the Anguttara Nikaya, where Lord Buddha is talking about who is it that should be venerated, who is it who should be respected or praised. He literally says, do not respect the bhikkhu, the person who possesses these eight qualities. And he's specifically talking about the opposite of the Noble Eightfold Path. Somebody who does not practice the Noble Eightfold Path is not deserving of veneration. Of Even he says, respect. You should not respect a person who doesn't have these Noble Eightfold Path. Basically, somebody who has wrong view. 
makes oneself, the person, be not respectable. In essence, you cannot call such a person venerable one. A title that we have, and we have it from Lord Buddha himself, when, when students would address him, as well as the bhikkhus, um, when people would address the bhikkhus, they would say the term, use the term bhante. Bhante. You can, you know, there's also the ayasma. Uh, but that is uh, in reference to within, within um, usually within sangha members. That's a term that is used, but bhante is the term. In English, roughly, it means somebody who is deserving of our veneration. Right? Why do we venerate someone? We venerate someone, we respect someone, we praise someone who is demonstrating qualities that is, or qualities that are quite difficult for us to embody ourselves, to live by, principles to live by ourselves, even one of them. So they become a, a, uh, an island of refuge for you, somebody you look up to, somebody that inspires you. They're doing th something that you know is precious. It could be just one thing, or it could be a series of wonderful things. There you go. That is your reason to pay respect. Now, of course, if the person, the, the venerable, is truly venerable, then it's a wonderful opportunity for the one doing the bowing, to really open one's heart, to be vulnerable. That's what you bow down to. You're essentially being vulnerable, showing vulnerability in the presence of someone. And what a beautiful thing. In the past, when I was a layman, um, a therapist, and I would meet couples, husbands and wives, and I would ask them as to why they use the term, I love you, to address each other. Some of them would say it all the time, or use terms of endearment as such. Oftentimes, I would pause them. I would ask them to stop and repeat that word, and see if they also could sense the emptiness of that term, meaning it's an empty bag. There's nothing else in it, just a term. I'm sorry is another one. Really are you sorry? Really, do you, do you mean to say, really, do you, do you, are you feeling that love? Not to, it's not a matter of cornering the person, that's not it. It is giving the person the opportunity to pause, to breathe, to absorb that moment, and to ask the question whether they truly feel something that compels them to say those words, to express what they are feeling. Unfortunately, what many people would be doing, and still do, is they turned it into a habit, especially before they hang up. I, I would notice this for years. Oh, I love you. Bye. Close the hang up. But really, do, do, do you mean that? You don't have to say I love you all the time. Because when you say I love you, you are completely showing, exposing yourself to the other person 
your vulnerability. Now, I'm not drawing similarities here as far as the vulnerability between these two uh, groups of people. No, uh, this is not to. Uh, this is uh, in in the Dhamma. We that would be uh, you know one is mundane, superficial compared to the Dhamma, and a bhikkhu is representative of Lord Buddha. A bhikkhu is a representative of the Dhamma. A bhikkhu is supposed to be a representative of the noble Sangha. And that's why we have the Tisarana, the three refuges. So it is a stopping of everything else that's going on in your life when you bring your hands together in front of your heart. You are stopping time. You are literally stopping, freezing time. Making that space, that place, wherever you are, that time, into a sacred bubble of time and space. You are bringing the sacredness into your life. Now, having said this, remember that thing I mentioned about Lord Buddha insisting throughout the suttas, you see this, countless suttas, you have this, where Lord Buddha says, do not respect a person who doesn't demonstrate nobility, it is not the robes that we are bowing down to. That needs to be understood. Now, this is difficult because how would you know? It's not like everybody you know, has the ability to, to psychically see, probe into the heart and mind of the person. But tap into your gut, into your intuition, into your heart. Would you know if somebody loves you? Would you know if somebody's genuinely smiling to you? at you, with you? Would you feel safe next to a person? How do you know? How do you feel safety in the presence of someone else? Even individuals whom you've just met. So, taking or, or um, Showing worshipfulness or bowing down to someone has a lot to do with the bower. The person doing the bowing. You see this, right? Because irrespective of the person in front of you to whom others are bowing and maybe you feel like or compelled like bowing down to, if there is compulsion, don't. <laughs> It's okay. You can still bring your hands together and just to be cordial, but it, you don't have to, unless it is your teacher, which should say a lot. Otherwise, why would you call someone your teacher if you don't have that sense of worshipfulness towards them? If it is still dubious, if it is still uncertain, why would you call someone your teacher? So again, it brings us back to the bower, the person doing the bowing. Now, oftentimes, many of us have issues with the whole, especially if we come from a different culture than the Asian. If you come from a Western culture, we have our own way of understanding and, and because there's been a lot of manipulation, especially if you are a person who thinks it does, does, is not exclusively just a Western thing, of course. I have to say that. But generally, especially if you've gone through the cultural mores and, and, and understand, you know, ethnic differences, etc., etc., I've, I've had these people, you know, the people say, me, say to me these things, that's what I mean. And I also had this proclivity or propensity to have this resistance towards. Well, why am I going to bow to this person, to this thing? 
But then you see something that is truly for you on a deep level, something that is venerable. You venerate it in your mind, in your heart. As you're coming face to face with it, 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 it could be something that moves you deeply. Now remember, we're living in a very, very crass time period. Very um, strange times where even beauty has been completely convoluted. Art has been completely convoluted. The smiles, the handshakes, the hugs, the, the greetings are all, you see this, on, on, and, and how it's being promulgated and, and promoted on social media and things. This whole concept of social circles or social friends, virtual, where entire exchanges of, of, of so-called conversations are done through texts, through messaging. That's not healthy. That has been eating away the humanity in us, in our societies. So when you do have that presence, that is venerable, the person doesn't know how to respond. Many people have been stuck in their homes for a few years, essentially. There is a lack of trust. By the way, vulnerability also holds the hand of trust. You cannot say I love you to a person whom you do not trust. It doesn't work. And that's why most marriages, most unions of such, have been failing miserably. Because people have been trying to come together and be vulnerable, but they're not. Everybody's bringing their own weaponry. And many individuals bring those weapons with them to the temple. Weapons, here, is a metaphor that I'm using. Their list of counter-arguments. Counter arguments against what? Their intuitive awareness. They're feeling something sublime that could happen. And that's why many people are unable to go deep in meditation. So, what we have is a very thin layer of society, social contact that we have at the moment. Values are dropping exponentially. And a bow is one of those remnants that we still have from our history as human species. Where something moves us, we drop on our knees. It's a beautiful thing. So, you see, there's a lot going on, just to give you an idea. But specifically, in this tradition, this is a... I'm a Buddhist monk, a Theravada and Buddhist monk. When I'm speaking, I'm, I'm referring back to the 2,000, almost 600 years of history that we have, starting from Lord Buddha himself, from India. His teachings that are found within the Pali Canon, what we call suttas or discourses. We see these traditions coming out of these discourses. They're, they're snapshots of reality, of the life that people lived. Now, why do I say this? Because the teaching itself is based on the three pillars, sometimes called the three trainings. One is virtue. The other one is mental cultivation, purifying the mind, the heart. That's why this path is unique. Because there isn't a sometimes situation 
a waiver somewhere in the virtue part, in the ethical, in the moral code, where a person has to take the five precepts. So if a bhikkhu or a person, in our case it's far more than five, obviously, but the five is very representative because it is it has within it so much. So even bhikkhus benefit greatly from the principle of the five precepts, not to harm, not to kill, intentionally, not to take anything that is not given freely, not to engage in any kind of sexual activity whatsoever in the case of bhikkhus. Any kind, anything to do. That also includes the mind, by the way. Okay? We're living in a very, very corrupt times where there are corruptions also in the sexual department with the monastics. Because there isn't that living in an uh, in a, in a environment where you have the safety of the bhikkhu surrounding you, where everybody sees everybody else. They know if something goes on. But now you have everybody spread out here and there, even monasteries. And there isn't the, as they say, checks and balances for which we have the Pati Mukha recitation, where you had the teacher-disciple, teacher-student relationship, where you had fellow companions in the holy life really driven to make sure that you and I were on the same path, practicing. And if somebody saw something that looked, quote-unquote, fishy, suspicious, they would go and address it with that monk or go to Lord Buddha and bring the topic, bring the reality to him. We don't have that anymore. I don't know of anything, including in the deepest, uh, most authentic, quote-unquote, um, orthodox, if you will, branches of the tradition somewhere in Asia. I don't even know of those places to even have such a thing anymore. So it's, it's, for me, it's futile to go looking for that in a community setting. So therefore, what am I saying? It is up to the individual. Of course, we have the guide. We have the Dhamma and Vinaya. Lord Buddha said in the, in the future, these things will happen. They were happening at his time. That's why he instituted so many laws, rules rather. They didn't need them for about 20 years. The Sangha didn't need any of these rules. But people, with their stupidity, made it necessary for Lord Buddha and the other Arahants to have to institute these, to, to follow these rules. Basic, basic, commonsensical rules that even a normal person, if you can find one today, a lay person would look at these rules and say, seriously? You had to say these things? You had to put this in, like, institute it in, in order for people to do it? People were actually doing it? Yes. But it's common sense. Well, forget it. So you don't have that now like a supervising committee, because if the person did not do it, I mean, in some places they are trying still to maintain that, but even that goes only so far. Ultimately, what you had eventually happen is people stuck to the word, the rule, and that, on the surface, it looks like, for them, for the person, yeah, I'm practicing, so I must be pure. Not exactly, not so fast. Remember what I said about the three trainings? I just mentioned the suttas, where Lord Buddha talks about sila, virtue, and then virtue is the, the vinaya, basically. Think of it as the five precepts, etc. Monks have 227. But it can also become so orthodox, so concretized, so jaded, that a person can focus on that and, and consider that as all in all. 
And that's what we have in several traditions that call themselves very authentic, very, you know, Vinaya-based tradition. At the cost of others, at the cost of Dhamma, at the cost of the humanity, at the cost of common sense. Common sense. So on the outside, the, the literal uh, rules or things are being kept. So in some, especially in cultures, certain cultures, people gravitate towards that and consider that as, ah, this is authentic, this is to be venerated. Not so fast, Lord Buddha says. Even though the person is practicing all these rules I just mentioned, 227. So for all intents and purposes, it might look, and it does look like, to the observer, observers, that, ah, this person is truly, you have entire um, traditions that came out of such a thing, because they saw that, hey, if I practice this, which, by the way, this goes down into, like, earlier history, far earlier than Buddhism. You see this in other branches of other religions where people are adamantly attached to their laws. This is what Lord Buddha also called rites and rituals. There's nothing special then about Buddhism when you look at that as Buddhist, as Dhamma, and that's what we have in many cases. On the surface, it looks like this. But I haven't told you what happens in private. That's on the public end of things. What is observable. Lord Buddha always insists on the bhikkhu being not a hypocrite. The bhikkhu behaving in private as he does in public. To behave the way he behaves in public, to also behave as such in private. Because you're supposed to be transparent. Because you're supposed to be reliable. Because you're supposed to be pure. Ah, another reason to bow down to. To become venerable. A venerable. So, virtue, and then I mentioned mental cultivation. Lord Buddha mentions how the Noble Eightfold Path, I said, right? If a, a bhikkhu has supposed, is supposed to have all these eight right view, right thoughts and intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, for bhikkhus, yes, we don't go to a job as such, but we do have a livelihood. We must be bhikkhus to live for the Dhamma, to live for the sasana, to not live for myself as an entity, as an individual, as a separate, as somebody who can just live not so differently than I did as a layman. No, 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 no. Then go and be a layman. I'm sorry. Why? Can, you know, there shouldn't be any conflicts there. It need, it's very clearly delineated. One has to live the Pabbaja, the going forth. You have to live that life. That's why. And you have to live it fully. That means you cannot think about anything that is vulgar, especially sex. Hint at it. Speak about it. Or drive people to perceive things about you, even if you're not engaging in any such vulgar things. Or give opportunities for, let's say, women come and flirt with you. Or you flirt with them. Hey, but I'm not doing anything. Well, it doesn't matter. You're causing agitation, disruption, suggesting, provoking, seducing. Where's the nobility in that? Where's the purity in that? Where's the brahmacharya in that? The holy life. The holy life which is supposed to be 100%, not 99.9, 100% chaste, a celibate lifestyle. Otherwise, just leave. 
there was one Ajahn who was one of Ajahn Chah's, uh, you know, uh, monks. He was a Japanese uh, uh, bhikkhu. And he had been for almost 40 years, if I'm not mistaken. So he was a Mahatera. He was one of the abbots in, 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 in Thailand. He was from Japan originally. But he would hang out. He would invite. He would very much uh, be in the company of lay people, especially women. And, you know. and then one day he gives a Dhamma talk. Uh, his weekly, I guess, Dhamma discourse. And then before sundown, after that, <laughs> that same day, from uh, what you know, I learned, he leaves, disrobes, on a plane back to Japan. Almost 40 years. And then it's, it's revealed pretty quickly that he went back to the lay life because of a woman that used to come and frequent the temple grounds. A, a Thai woman who is, uh, or was, or is um, 20 years, I think, younger than him. So, uh, from what I know, he's still alive. And this happened uh, over, I think, 11, 12 years ago. How do you negotiate that if you really had faith in this person? He was wearing robes. He was following the 227. You know, he was doing all the so-called right things. This can cause a lot of people to lose faith. This is really ugly. Even though, let's say, in the, in the, what I had learned about this, when I heard it, um, they say that, I don't know if it's true or not, that he did not engage in any sexual activities before disrobing. If that is true, that is great for his kamma. Otherwise, it's really, really bad. But again, this is not, you know, for a layperson who was bowing, showing venerations, showing respect. What do you respond? How do you respond? Especially if this person shows up, and, and a few years later, I think he showed up in Thailand, but he did not go, from what I know, to the place, the area of Thailand. He went to the more, you know, other areas, closer to Bangkok, where, you know, his supporters might not see him. In a way, you can understand, I guess. You can appreciate that. But how would you wear? How would you, how would you put on a pair of pants after so many years? How would you... That's supposed to be your skin. The robes are like your skin. Can you remove your skin? Can you remove your eyeballs? So before the laity comes down, comes down on their knees and bows, bows worshipfully to what we represent, we must be bowing to the Dhamma in our hearts. We must be living the Dhamma, which goes far beyond just rules and regulations, Lord Buddha says, repeatedly in the Anguttara Nikaya, not worshipping the letter of the word and considering that to be the Dhamma. No. And this is where Sila Samadhi Panya, the third training, comes in, which requires wisdom. That's, that's wisdom, Panya. They need to go hand in hand. Because oftentimes in Asia especially, or Asian individuals or people who have been, 
geared into thinking in a certain way, that a person is venerated, is considered a venerable, with the amount of vasas they have, what we call reigns, how many you know, years they've been a monk, a higher ordained monk. And that is like the hierarchy. It's interesting because I have rarely come across suttas in the discourses I was mentioning, in the Nikayas, entire Nikayas. Rarely have I come, I, I think I, I remember maybe one or two instances where encounters had happened, where one of them is uh, Venable Asaji when uh, Venable Sariputta, before he became Sariputta, before he became a bhikkhu, I mean, he was Upatissa and he asked Venable Asaji to, to teach him the Dhamma of his teacher and he said, no, no, I, I recently only became a bhikkhu. Recently. And there's another uh, couple of suttas like that. But in the thousands and thousands, I've never seen a bhikkhu meeting another bhikkhu and, and checking, you know, their papers, as it were. Hey, how many vasas do you have? No, because that has also become a factor of veneration. People do not necessarily venerate a novice monk. They will go after the big one over there, the, the one who has, uh, you know, who looks older. Therefore, immediately they construe, misconstrue rather, that, oh, okay, so he is to be venerated. Of course, there's a difference between novices and bhikkhus, but the vasa part, that's what I'm trying to say, because even amongst bhikkhus, that has become the new norm, which is quite sad and funny at the same time. Where when they meet, the first thing they ask, how many vasas do you have? Again, they go by one or two things they might have read here in the suttas somewhere, and that becomes their criterion for gauging. It's amazing when, and it's interesting because one of my students, she mentioned this to me, and uh, how bante. When Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Punna Mantaniputta met, there was no question like, uh, excuse me, uh, this is like Venerable Sariputta asking Venerable Ma Punna Mantaniputta, both of them Arahants who had never met each other, by the way. Venerable Sariputta, being the chief disciple to Lord Buddha, did not feel like, you know, well, I have the authority to ask when he met Venerable Punna Mantaniputta. You know what he asked? He asked him questions on the Dhamma. Because before he opened his mouth and asked, communicated verbally his questions, he was observing him, following him after his Pindapada, after his meal observing how the Venerable, Venerable Punna Mantaniputta, was walking so beautifully, so gracefully, so elegantly, so present. Today we don't necessarily appreciate, it seems. We go after the most ostentatious thing Things that we can see and, I mean, write down or see written somewhere. And that says about a lot about us, the person, the public, the society. That's what I mean by the Bowers also have a lot to do with this. So does the person who's about to worship, they're not like coming with a clean slate, you know. They have their own issues. Because the person might be convoluted, might be completely smudged and tainted in their mind, in their thinking, as to why they're there. So first, the person has to be in a place of cleanliness in the mind, in the heart.
So it's a good question. And it's something that I believe, and there are very few things as Buddhists we believe. <laughs> it's a form of, you know, it's a conventional term, I guess I use. But it's a good thing to ask oneself before each bow you do, you commit to, you become vulnerable to, to allow yourself. Is it authentic? Just like when you're saying as a layperson to someone, you know, dear to you, I love you. Or not. Even that not part, the missing of the, that phrase, that still can be a beautiful moment, even though you didn't say it. But at least you kept being authentic, which is the bottom line. That's what I'm trying to say. It needs authenticity. And Dhamma is all about authenticity. All about authenticity. That authenticity is what compels a person to even start crying when they bring their hands together. You see countless examples in the suttas where individuals uh, gave up what they had. The only robe they had on their back, the only one, there was a couple, actually, they only had one set of robes. That means they can cover, it was so short, it could only cover, cover I'm sorry, one part of the body. And for one person only. They were so poor. So the husband would borrow the robe one part of the day. The wife would borrow it the other part of the day when she would go and have to go and go, I guess, do some farming so that she can earn some money to go to the shops and buy something, some rice, and come and cook. They were naked at home. They didn't have money. But when Lord Buddha came, I think it was in Savati, when they heard he was coming to Savati, they rushed, but then they had a dilemma. Because they both were incredibly pulled, attracted to the Dhamma because of their merits, because of their purity in their hearts. They were such beautiful human beings. But then they came up with a compromise where Lord Buddha, they, they knew, they, they, I guess, learned about the daily agenda of Lord Buddha. So they would go one part of the day when Lord Buddha is giving a talk, and then when Lord Buddha would rest, and then it, later on in the day, or at night, one, the husband would go with, his, with the robe. And then he bows down. The Lord Buddha, with his one set of robe, that night in the congregation, there's monks, bhikkhunis, there's lay people, there's upasakas, upasakas, lay and female disciples, white wearing, white robe wearing disciples, and everybody's listening quietly. Nobody's moving, nobody's saying anything. And it's, stars are up, it's dark but it's bright everywhere because Lord Buddha is giving a talk on the Dhamma and Lord Buddha sees the mind of this very, very poor, poor, poor man. And the king is there too with his entourage. He's also listening. And this man suddenly is so full of showing respect and veneration to the Dhamma, to Lord Buddha. He realizes how rare of an opportunity this is for him to be born as a human, Lord Buddha is there and he's giving a talk and he's getting it. He's understanding it. And suddenly, he's so, he, he gives himself to that moment. He's so vulnerable. He is truly worshipful. He brings his hands together and he says, I won. He cries it out. He actually exclaims it. He, he yells it out. You see, what he was thinking of was he wanted to give something to Lord Buddha other than his bow, other than his tears, other than his tearful smile and his joyful heart. He was debating earlier 
What would have happened? I don't have anything, but I have to give something. What would happen if I give this rope to Lord Buddha? And then he said, he was about to, but then he thought, but my wife, what does she think? What would she do? Because that's, 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 all, that's all we have. But his heart's certainty, that again comes from that moment of worshipfulness, being truthful, authentic, seeing what's in front of you, seeing who's in front of you, in his case. And he took off his robe. He became completely naked. He folded it so gently. It's tattered, one can imagine, tattered. Stained, maybe, even, because that's all they have. Folds it so beautifully. Maybe even kisses it and puts it against his forehead and places it at the feet of Lord Buddha. And he says, I conquered. I have conquered. In tears. And Lord Buddha smiles. He knows what was happening. And by the way, that man becomes a Sotapanna. He becomes a noble disciple. So, in essence, it is a generosity that you're displaying when you're bowing to yourself, to that moment that you're alive. You're acknowledging the rarity of the fact that you are alive. You are a human being and you are in the presence of something that is truly venerable. And there is a source in front of you that is inspiring you. So the person that we are venerating must be inspiring. The words they say, if it's a live person, the words they say must be, as Lord Buddha says, remembered. That's what I mean by someone who is venerable. And not go through the motions, not go through the routines of bowing, bowing, and leaving. And the same thing is extended, as I was saying with this gentleman, to the giving of dana, the, gener the generosity, the, having, uh, the exercise of uh, liberality, to be able to give and be open-handed, Lord Buddha says, open-handed. You don't think, just like that man. But you don't do it out of a habit. You don't do it out of forcefulness or compulsion because somebody else gave it too. You need to check. It's like that saying of, I love you. I have to check myself. Am I in, in that state where I can come up from that space of venerability, of interesting, venerability and vulnerability? Interesting. Truly a beautiful thing. Hmm.